Welcome to Moment of Truth with Amy Chen Mills. That's me, where we bring you clear thinking on confusing topics in challenging times. In a few minutes, we will be joined by our guests for today, Gay Liberation Pastor Mike Mashiro and former Russian Orthodox Church minister, social activist, and current author Father Nathan Monk for our special holiday show, Reimagining Jesus. But first, local news with global repercussions. Today is December 18th, nearly one week after our Santa Cruz, California City Council saw 170 to 200 people fill chambers to standing room only, with dozens of activists and concerned citizens looking in from overflow outside. The vast majority of people there, I estimate 98%, were there to request and pressure the council to adopt a resolution advocating for a ceasefire in the Israel-Gaza war. Roughly 30 to 40% were Jewish, with a number of Jewish rabbis and leaders who spoke mostly for a ceasefire resolution and one against. This would not be the first time our council and even our county have weighed in on international matters. From a recent article in Lookout by Christopher Neely, political reporter, Neely reports in March 2022, supervisors passed a resolution condemning in the strongest possible terms the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In August of this year, Supervisor Manu Koenig signed a proclamation commemorating the 32nd anniversary of Ukrainian independence. In February of this year, Santa Cruz Mayor Fred Fred Keeley proclaimed February 24th, 2023, solidarity with the people of Ukraine Day. Moment of Truth was at this city council meeting last week live, and we gathered interviews with folks who showed up, one of whom was local Japanese-American activist Lucien Kubo. I'm here with Lucien Kubo outside of Santa Cruz City Hall, and Lucien Kubo is here with the Asian-American Pacific Islander Santa Cruz Collective Group. Is that correct? Well, yes. Um, not officially we're, but many individuals were getting together and raising our voice to, for ceasefire. And tell me why you support a ceasefire. You said earlier you're not on any side. Uh, so tell me why you support a ceasefire. Well, I'm on the side of all human beings. I just feel that right now um, there's been over. It's overkill. You know, it was horrible what happened on October seventh, but for the uh, 12,000, um, 1,200 people, but now it's 17,000 Gazan people, and I just don't know when it's gonna end. And I just really feel uh, for the people there and all the people in the Mid Mid East. So I, I guess I just really want us to unite all around ceasefire. You were saying that you feel like there isn't a lot of time left for the Palestinian people. Well, what I've heard is that in this five or six weeks of this massive bombing, it's been the equivalent of two nuclear bombs, like Hiroshima and Nagasaki in this small area. and. Um, food, water, um, housing, the people, refugees. Is this is this a, apps, is this horrifying to think of the of the the people there? I know that you're a Japanese artist, Japanese American artist, um, living in Santa Cruz County, and you've been active on, for lots of social justice issues. Do you feel like the experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki plays into how you feel about this issue? Well, and yes, um, and also being Japanese Americans, what the Japanese did during World War II was wrong, okay? But what I'm saying is that what our government is doing is wrong now, and we need to stand up against that, just like, you know, the Japanese Americans stood up against Japanese militarism, and just like we need to speak up against this military so-called solution. We need a peaceful solution right now. Thank you, Lucien Kubo. Right after this, I walked up to the front of the very long line leading up to council chambers and spoke with a Jewish community member, Lori Palmer. I'm outside of Santa Cruz City Hall, and there's a line of about 60 people and growing waiting to get in uh, to speak on the ceasefire. Non-resolution, actually, it's not on the agenda right now. 
Um, and I am here with Lori Palmer, who is a professor at UCSC and a member of Jewish Voice for Peace. Lori, why are you here today? I'm here for the city council to vote on a ceasefire resolution. There is, um, uh, it's a very simple um, request, which is a resolution to stop the violence that is going on in Gaza and Palestine. And it is a very simple request. And we feel like this would be um, something that the city needs to get behind to be on the right side of history and to um, make it clear that we want to end the violence that's happening and the massacre that's happening in Palestine. Personally, um, I, I feel like the issues of the ongoing occupation and the, the power differential between the Palestinian people and the Israeli state is absurdly um, uneven. I mean, I, I, I want to really focus that what we're asking for here and now is for a ceasefire. And I don't know that I want to launch into right now the whole debate around genocide and all that. And so the call right now is for just getting us, since it's not on the agenda today, the call is to get is to get this on the agenda for the next meeting or what is the actual call or demand we would like them to bring it on today and to adopt the ceasefire resolution that the oakland city council has already put together which is a very straightforward um resolution it does not um cast blame um but it does make it clear that the violence needs to stop thank you laurie so at this point, I was looking around for someone who might speak in opposition to the ceasefire resolution. There weren't very many people, actually maybe one, two, or three. I saw a man with a Star of David t-shirt and baseball cap. I'm here with Eli Karen at uh, the Santa Cruz City Council outside of Chambers. There's about 150 to 160 people now waiting in line to get into Chambers. And Eli's the only one I can see actually with the Star of David t-shirt and hat. And so Eli, um, tell me why you are here regarding this. Um, actually, it's not even on the agenda, but as you know, activists want to put a ceasefire resolution on the City Council agenda. I think that advocating for international politics at a local level is a huge waste of resources. I think it's inefficient. I think it's ineffective. And I think that our local politicians have no business bringing international politics into our local community. I think it's a great way to divide a community, um, which it, it, it clearly has, which is really sad. And I think that you can have your opinions, you can have differing opinions than mine, and there's a forum for it. I just don't think that the city council chambers is that forum. So there have been um, ceasefire resolutions passed in various cities across the United States. I'm assuming the logic is that as many as can be passed then influences our state representatives and our federal representatives. Just to show kind of like numbers, do you feel like that's not significant or? Good question. I think that the federal government knows that of the 50 some Arab countries in the, in the area, in the region, uh, there's one country that is a democracy. And I think that they know that without that democracy, the United States is in big trouble. And I think it's a fairly ironic that the very freedoms afforded everybody here and everybody across the United States who wants a ceasefire, uh, calls for them to speak out against the government, those very freedoms, those are protected in one country in the Middle East, and that's Israel. And so effectively what a ceasefire would do in, in our, in my mind, and I think in the minds of many pro-Israel supporters, is it would lead to the eventual elimination of the Israeli state and, and, effect, and the Jewish state. And I think that if you lose the Jewish state, Hamas is your problem too, and ISIS is your problem too. And I think that there's not many protections in that region with the exception of Israel. So I think that it will have no impact. A ceasefire, there's a huge reason I'm here, is it's, it's, it's a waste to have this on the agenda or to try to get this on the agenda because it will have no impact whatsoever. I don't think that the Israeli parliament cares what Santa Cruz, California says about a ceasefire or what Oakland, California says about a ceasefire or what California says about a ceasefire. I think they care about what President Biden says about a ceasefire. And to date, Biden's been pretty staunch that he supports the elimination of Hamas so that the Palestinian people can live a free and more democratic, more, it doesn't have to be democratic, live a more free and fair life. Do you, as are you an Israeli person or a Jewish person? I'm Jewish, yep. And so, I think a lot of people are here as I'm talking to them, 
because of they're seeing, you know, famine in, in Gaza, they're seeing a place like nowhere, there's nowhere for people to go and avoid being killed or being, or not having food and water. And so there, I think a lot of people are feeling like they want to prevent sort of like a mass death situation. Um, and I think that's why you see so many people here. Do you feel, have any thoughts or feelings about how many Gazans have been killed so far and what the future looks like for them. I do. I completely agree with all of those sentiments. And I think it's a, a tremendous tragedy. And I think that this is exactly why Israel needs to defeat Hamas so that we can stop having Palestinians suffer, innocent Palestinians suffer. It's, it's tragic. It's unthinkable what they're going through. Um, it's unforgivable what Hamas has done to those people and what Hamas is forcing Israel to do. And, and as soon as Hamas is gone, then those people live a much better life. We get to rebuild the community, we get to rebuild the region, and we get to let them have a, a true living rather than this oppression they've lived under for the last almost 20 years. That was Eli Karen at the Santa Cruz City Council uh, meeting right before it started, where there was a long four-hour discussion about a possible ceasefire resolution to be placed on the City Council agenda. I mean, clearly there are a lot of uh, points that people could dispute in all of this. Um, I just wanted to mention that in particular in Eli's uh, statements about the only democracy in the Middle East, that's disputed given that, you know, Palestinians in the occupied territories do not vote, are not allowed to vote um, in Israeli elections, and that there's been historical resistance to allowing for any Arab majority to happen in the state of Israel. The stance uh, about uh, Eli's um, mention of Joe Biden's stance while I was sitting in council chambers, I actually got a ding from the Washington Post and notice. And it was interesting because right then there was an article that came out from the Post saying that Biden says Israel is losing support worldwide over indiscriminate bombing in Gaza. Of course, there's much more that can be talked about, and we will do that in a future show. Um, one thing is very clear. Many, many thousands of non-combatants have died already in this war from initial attacks by Hamas on southern Israel October 7th to hostages who have since been killed in captivity to nearly 20,000 Palestinians now, 40% of them children, making this one of the most deadly conflicts in human history, and especially for children. The Israeli blockade of food, water, medicine, and the bombardment and forced evacu evacuation of hospitals, displacement, and exposure for over a million displaced Gazans now facing starvation and diseases like cholera are setting people in Gaza up for an apocalyptic scenario. This is according to not just the Gazan Health Ministry, but also spokespeople from UN relief organizations inside Gaza, UNICEF, and the Save the Children Foundation. To be fair, Hamas continues to launch rockets into Israel, the vast majority of which are deflected by Israel's Iron Dome. It is also clear that a massive sea change is underway in public opinion opinion locally and globally regarding Israel, Gaza, the West Bank, what many call Palestine, the occupation and settlement programs. It feels to me like the world will actually never be the same. In the end, the council voted five to two to support further discussion of a ceasefire, and this clearly would not have happened without member Sandy Brown's motion and Sonia Brunner's second to do so. And today we are speaking about a figure who, you could say, inadvertently helped to create this mess, Jesus Christ, accidental founder of the Christian religion, many adherents to which are part of Zionist lobby groups like AIPAC or the American Israeli Political Action Committee. What would Jesus have said about all this violence in the Holy Land? Did he even want to start a new religion at all? Or was he the misunderstood Jewish prophet and rabbi that spoke truths so deep and profound they have become lost in the complexities and power struggles of human religion? We'll be talking about Jesus during this time of winter solstice and outer darkness in the Northern Hemisphere and really in the world right after this station break. Welcome to Moment of Truth with Amy Chen Mills. We are doing doing a special holiday program called Reimagining Jesus Today with our two special guests who should be on the line with us now. We have uh, Nathan Monk is a social justice, justice advocate, author, and former Orthodox priest. He lives in East Tennessee with his wife and three children. He's the author of All Saints Hotel and Cocktail Lounge, The Miracle and Chasing the Mouse. 
Having experienced homelessness with his family during his teenage years, Nathan has gone on to found numerous programs provi- providing food, clothing, emergency resources, and shelter. Over the years, he has worked with business professionals and government officials to help bring success to their philanthropic work. Welcome, Nathan. Hello. How are you? Thank you for having me today. Yeah, we're pretty excited to have you, given the kind of following you have, the kind of writing you've done, which I've been going through your Substack and reading a lot of your Substack articles and we're going to start with you since we're still trying to get Mike on the line with us. I thought it would just be nice to start with your personal story of being drawn to and this is what I'm really curious about is why were you drawn to become a minister in the Russian Orthodox Church to begin with? There must have been a spark of some kind and then you know I've been reading your Substack about how you came out of the church and it was pretty dramatic to be honest but if you could sort of give us your version of events, uh, it would be great for our readers to hear. I'm I'm sorry, listeners. (laughs) Well, I I appreciate that. Uh, To give sort of a a, a concise version, I I grew up in an evangelical Pentecostal environment um, in my young adulthood, and my family had, you know, always been religious. And so for me, I when I ended up in the Orthodox Church, part of that was because I was seeking to get away from this sort of like mega church evangelical mindset that I had been raised in, which was a very prosperity gospel, end times, apocalyptic focus mentality. And I wanted to search for something that was more ancient, something that felt closer to Jesus. And I think for the majority of my life, that has has been the goal it was wanting to be close to Christ was wanting to be close to this you know character that I had read about and and felt that I had this you know intimate relationship with this 2000 some odd year uh, old figure but uh, in the Orthodox Church I began to also find some of those those same flaws that I experienced even in evangelicalism which was a propensity towards uh, othering people and and violence towards people who are different or or live their life outside of the norm, and I just couldn't find that sort of vitriol uh, in the scriptures. I found in Christ someone who seemed uh, welcoming, who was constantly spending time with the outcast, and so over time. Uh, I ultimately decided to leave the Orthodox Church and really um, begin to deconstruct my entire religious understanding, which really led me to, as you alluded to earlier with my Substack series, was about wanting to, when I first left the church, I would say a phrase that I'm sure many people who have left uh, evangelical or, or mainline Christianity have said, you know, it's not that I stopped loving Jesus. Uh, I still love Jesus. I just had a falling out with the church. After nearly a decade out of mainline Christianity, I began to really question Jesus as well. And I think that was why I began to write that series was I wanted to, a decade out, reevaluate this figure of Jesus and who they really were uh, what we can learn and extrapolate from the scriptures, but also how do we translate that into a modern context? Yeah, so I'm really interested to hear what you've come up with, and I also want to give Mike Mashiro a chance to tell your stories. Mike Mashiro, who is a public speaker, content creator, and thought leader, he is the founder of NUMA, an organization that supports people of faith recovering from religious toxicity. Mike is a gay advocate for the LGBTQ plus community and a queer theology enthusiast. He is a consultant and coach for gay men recovering from evangeliz- evan- okay, evangelism. <laughs> he also has a team of coaches who work with people whose faith is evolving. Welcome to the show, Mike Mashiro. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. So Mike, we're talking, you know, with Father Nathan Monk, and, and I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Is it May? Shiro? It's Maya Shiro. Maya Shiro. Shiro. Okay. Uh, And we're talking, we've been talking with Nathan about his story of how he entered the church and then came out of it. I know you have a similar story. I'm struck by some things I've seen on your website around just 
like that you have met Jesus, that you love Jesus. That's that's something I find in both of your work is how much you turn towards love as a power, as a force to guide you in your mm-hmm. decision making. So I wonder if you could tell your story a little bit of how you got involved, because you are, I believe, still a pastor in the Christian church. Um, and then how you what happened to you that you started to question what was going on in the church? Yeah. So, um, hi, Father Nathan. Similarly to what he shared, I mean, a lot of my story is very similar. Um, I was uh, in ministry full time, right? That was my main gig. And I was also deeply closeted as a gay person. And the church environment I was a part of, I was part of a famous church in California. They were very anti, like publicly anti LGBTQ plus people. And so, you know, I was in the closet for most of that time. And eventually just got to the point where in my own spiritual journey, I couldn't do it anymore. There was, I was having like what I would describe as spiritual convictions about like radical experiences that were exposing that my complicity with a harmful institution that was silencing and erasing and harming queer people was not acceptable. It was not okay. Right. And I was part of that. So I, they divested from there and came out publicly a few years ago. And so that was like the end of my time at that church and with all of the connections I had. So I used to travel and speak on in conferences and at churches and workshops and things and all those invitations disappeared overnight. It was wild. Um, and just, I don't, that made me dive deeper into the theology and what I had been raised in evangelicalism to believe my whole life and how to interpret the Bible. And there were a lot of holes that I didn't have answers for, but when I finally came out, I finally also then had the freedom to ask other questions that were off the table when I was, you know, technically like hired by the institution. So I started doing a lot of deep dive reading and like hunting down other voices and authors who are, you know, alive right now and just went on a pilgrimage of sorts and so much of what I'd been taught about Jesus and the Bible started getting exposed as propaganda as opposed to, you know, sourced and substantiated (laughs) theology. Um, And so the Christian nationalism thing was a big problem in the Christianity that I left behind. Um, The homophobic and transphobic and heterosexist bent, the patriarchy, like there's so many things about the theology I was raised with that I found to be deeply problematic. And then also evangelicals at large, just as they reacted to me coming out, they were some of the nastiest, vicious, most unkind people I've encountered in my life. It was shocking. So, you know, I've spent the last few years now doing the work of putting into like layman's terms, how and why the things that I've been taught my whole life that, you know, had biblical backing were actually not true and not authoritative and not God inspired and actually the opposite of those things. Um, Because there are so many queer people who are raised in environments like I was raised in, and we are indoctrinated from a very young age to hate ourselves, to think that our own human nature is like our natural propensities are wicked and against God and perverted and abominable. And that's not true. So anyway, this can go in so many directions. But yeah, that's ultimately what led me out of what I was involved with before. And now I wear the term pastor as more of like a like a heart posture and like you know, like proximity to ministerial work and theological study that I am engaging in. Um, But I'm not officially on, I am on staff at a church, but I'm not holding the pastor title in that particular role anymore. Yeah. And you actually have a really big following on Instagram and I, that's where I first found you and you, Mm. you know, some of the statements you've, you've been making, I, I just sort of was like, Oh, thank goodness. Someone is, you know, Speaking so forthrightly about these mm. issues, you know, yeah. a part of me, you know, we live in a very blue area of, of California and Northern California. And a part of me, when I, you know, look at some of your posts and I read uh, more about uh, Father Nathan Monk's uh, stuff on Substack and so forth, a part of me is a little shocked that, like, we're still, like, this is still a thing. Totally. But then we've seen this in the even the rise of, I guess, like, political evangelical right mm. but also we're seeing people leaving in a in a movement called exvangelical and deconstruction and i yeah. want to just i mean it you know a lot of people think well you could just walk out of the church and why just leave like you know hey we're all living these great lives out here we don't worry about this stuff right <laughs> but uh, father nathan is on the line with us um he's an author and was a, a former minister for the russian orthodox church and i just want to read a passage from one of your Substack essays about leaving the church 
This is what happened to Father Nathan Monk. In the aftermath of denouncing the priesthood, I was censored by the church and had my facilities removed. I'm not sure what facilities means, but I hope that's not like a physical part of your body. (laughs) I guess it's like your your space, right? The seminary I attended was closed. The bishop who ordained me disposed. And the ordination of hundreds of priests was placed on hold until the hierarchy could figure out how an apostate like me was allowed into the ranks of the clergy. My family had to flee in the middle of the night from our home, packing only the essentials for fear of retaliation. I received near daily threats of violence against myself and my family. I received a call in the middle of the night telling me to kill myself. So, wow. Uh Father Nathan Monk. I mean, is this even traumatizing to hear this again? But it's just striking to me how much sort of violence and hostility came out of you just saying, I'm I'm leaving because I can't support hatred against LGBTQ plus people anymore and others. Well, and to set a little bit of a backdrop for what was happening at the time that I left, uh, uh, the, the women of Pussy Riot had been arrested <laughs> um, in Russia in 2012. And that was sort of one of the first things that began to kind of pull back the veil of what was really happening, uh, not just in Russia, but also in the Russian Orthodox Church and their support of some of, some of these draconian laws and practices. Um, Anti- L- anti-LGBT, yeah, sorry, continue. I just yeah, wanted to yeah, give some these, context. These anti- yeah, these anti-LGBTQ laws that, that considered pride parades propaganda. Um, and so by, you know, 2013, when, when DOMA was overturned and so many of the clergy's response were, we want to see what's happening in Russia happen in the United States. And, and I became fearful. I said, you know, I'm afraid that we are going to begin outsourcing the same sort of policies, procedures, and practices of Russia here in the United States. And I started, uh, you know, after I left the priesthood, I began to sound that alarm uh, over a decade ago, um, long before we had collusion between Trump and Russia, long before we had any of those types of things happening. you know, I don't think that anything that is happening is new. And I, I, I don't think Mike, having lived in the evangelical church, would disagree with this, that, that what we're seeing now happening on the national stage uh, is exactly as designed. You know, if you look at the character of Nikolai Carpathia in the Left Behind series, uh, they modeled that 100 percent after Russia. Uh, if you look at uh, the apocalyptic Zionist mentality of the evangelical church, which has really bled into uh, the Russian Orthodox Church's idea that we must have a global conflict in order to bring Jesus back. Uh, the conflict isn't to be avoided, it's to be ushered in, um, to break the seals so that the uh, apocalypse can begin and Jesus can return. And, and so the, it, it all loops back into why you can't get the Christian church to care about uh, things like climate change. They don't care because they think that great floods are normal ways for a deity to respond to the depravity of a society. And so they're not wanting to stop Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They're not looking for peace in the Middle East. They welcome these things because they think that it's the key to bring Jesus back. We're going to have to go to a short break. Then we're talking with Mike Mayashiro, uh, who is a, uh, a Christian leader um, helping gay people to deconstruct the oppression that they have been living under under the church, and Father Nathan Monk, who was a former priest with the Russian Orthodox Church.
Hi, and welcome back to Moment of Truth with Amy Chen Mills. Our show today is called Reimagining Jesus, and we're hopefully going to get to that part. Right now, we are talking with uh, Father Nathan Monk, who's the author of several books, who uh, is a former Russian Orthodox priest, and Mike Mayashiro, uh, who is a huge um, Instagram influencer and runs an organization called NUMA that helps uh, people who are trying to come out of the evangelical church and self-hatred and self-judgment and other hatred and other judgment that is a part um, of that world. And it's so interesting, uh, Father Nathan Monk, that you're talking about the evangelical community and how they are a part of, because I've just been learning, oh, they're a part of uh, the Arab, I'm sorry, not Arab, um, American Israeli Political Action Committee, APAC, which is really heavily funded and funds a lot of Congress people. Um, and I and it was been interesting to me to watch how um, they're so supportive of, of Israel, but then in the end, when the rapture comes, what happens to Jewish people is my question. Do you know what what is supposed to happen to Jewish people when the rapture comes and Jesus Christ comes back and so on? Oh well, sure. I mean, if if you follow through the actual evangelical thinking, um, they are not concerned about the Jewish community. They are concerned about one Jew and one Jew only, and that is Jesus Christ and getting him back uh, in his seat of power because they think, and it's such a a strange mindset because one of the big disagreements that, that, that Judas and others started to have with Jesus was this idea that he wasn't violent enough. They want, they were waiting for a Messiah who was going to come in and overthrow the government you know, fight on their behalf and and create a rebellion and uprising. And then Jesus comes along and is like, I'm going to come in on a donkey, a symbol of peace. I'm not going to fight. I'm going to teach you how to lay down your weapons. And then what's funny is we're repeating history, right? Is that the evangelicals are now coming along and they're like, well, Jesus wasn't violent the first time or caused a political uprising the first time, but you better believe the second time he's killing everyone I don't like. And so really anyone who doesn't look, think, or act like the evangelicals, the Christian nationalists, um, even if they're being used as a pawn, uh, the weapons will turn back towards them eventually. And so, you know, unless you are a white, Christian, affluent, upper middle class person, you know, just like Jesus, uh, then you're going to be on the, uh, the bad side of history here. Yeah. Um, And I just want to tell uh, all of our listeners that if you want to call in and have a question or uh, a comment for Father Nathan Monk or Mike Mayashiro uh, about this show, this program called Reimagining Jesus and coming out of these uh, very conservative sort of uh, tightly wound, you know, churches. That's what we're talking about today. The number is 831-900-5773, 831-900-5773. You can call that number or you can text. Do not call 800 because I've heard that that is actually a sex chat line. <laughs> so I hope I can say that on the air. That's what someone told me. Um, and then you can also email on air at ksqd.org. That's on air at ksqd.org, and we will try to track all these things um, on our screens uh, when you call in or when you text uh, or email us. Now, I want to turn to the figure of Jesus, and one of the reasons that I wanted to do the show is because I have always felt a resonance with the figure of Jesus. And there's Jesus that shows up in the Bible. There's Jesus who's interpreted by these different churches and religions. And there's also Jesus as Jesus speaks in these books of the Bible, some of which I've actually been reviewing my red letter text in my Bible, um, sounds so beautiful. It's I think that people really resonate with the part of Jesus that talks about, you know, like the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Mike Mayashiro, you talk about meeting Jesus, I think, when you were the age of 18. So, And it's okay to, if you guys want to criticize Jesus, that's fine. We're clearly not a religious show. But, but I want to get to the sort of like your heartfelt connection when you say, I met Jesus. What what does that mean to you and how do you think about Jesus now? Yeah, so at some point in my journey I used the phrase I met Jesus. And now I would say 
<laughs> I met God, whatever, whoever, whatever we conceive God to be, or at least whatever I did, I was encountering this person, this entity, this idea. Um, so to me, God was a person. And I say all this because I know that I've met a lot of people in my journey who have very different kinds of beliefs, especially post Christianity, right? But still are spiritual and like still hold space for these things. And so there's lots of different iterations of that. So I just want to be respectful of like the different ways people interpret all this. But for me, I was having really intense, deeply emotional experiences. Um, and it's hard for me just to chalk them up as just being sensationalized because like I changed as a person multiple times from these radical encounters is probably how I would phrase that for lack of a better term. So I don't think at this point, I don't think I met the person of Jesus in these moments that I was talking about. Um, but I do hold this belief that I did encounter some kind of, maybe I could say divine presence of divine love that I didn't know was available to be encountered, to be impacted by, um, but it radically changed my life and me and how I see people and my even my even my conception of love and the nature of love and what's possible within love like it changed so much about what I knew and what I had been taught in church and so I that actually really informed how I taught when I was teaching at a ministry school and you know like it there was a different edge to the way that I spoke about Jesus, the Gospels, and the Bible than, you know, I think what was common. And people were really responsive to that because I think underneath the terrible theology we're all ra like people in evangelicalism are raised with, there's this other part of us that genuinely has empathy and compassion for people and a lot of evangelical exclusivism has to forego those basic human functions in order to uphold, you know, this idealized version of what they believe the kingdom looked like that Jesus spoke of. So anyway, that's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so can you talk about the context of how you, it wasn't necessarily, maybe that was how you framed it in your mind meeting Jesus, because that was sort of your conditioning, right? Your, your, yeah. your thought conditioning, but what was the context and then what changed? Like what exactly changed? I just am really curious. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it probably happened 12 times over the span of 16 years. Okay. Um, so the, some of the times were different, but like the first couple of times it happened, I was in a church service, like in the middle of a worship set. Um, so, you know, there's a band on stage and we're singing, we're worshiping God, right? It was that kind of a setting. And then all of a sudden I'm having a very different experience than, you know, what's going on in a room. Um, and the second time it happened was probably one of the most impactful experiences I've had. I basically like started having this interactive conversation with whoever I know God to be. And it could very well have been with my own psyche or subconscious or something like, you know, people in the psychology side of this can go nuts on that and that's fine. But as far as my perception was con is concerned, I was interacting with some presence within myself and they were advocating for me as a gay man and I was still so deeply in the closet back then that I didn't know what to do with what they were saying to me but I was also very aware of how loved and accepted and seen and embraced I felt in this exchange like it wasn't just a cute sentiment I was being loved you know in that experience and so when I came out of that exchange of like this presence that I understood to be God telling me they wanted me to be gay, which was so opposite of every theolog theological bent I'd ever heard about gay people in the Bible. Um, I walked away from that experience with a deep sense of peace and like connection to God and accepted like acceptance within God, even though I couldn't say it out loud and didn't know how to talk about it theologically, I that did change for me on a human level. And I think I ended up not suffering in a lot of ways that other gay people in evangelical spaces do because of that experience like it lifted off this fear of hell and this fear of being contrary to god or separate from god or you know those so a lot of my psychological suffering was coming from the bad theology um that i very much you know embraced and like labored under um so that was like probably one big example um Another time after that, I, it was probably about a six month period where I was kind of a basket case and just like, just felt so exposed. And when I saw another person being kind to someone else, 
or if someone like said the name Jesus, I would just start crying because I just felt so exposed to the love of God and it was everywhere. God was just so humble and kind and gracious and loving and innocent and it was blowing my mind and it was so different than anything I considered about God, but it was so experiential. And so that like really opened me up to like, an, I think another level of like compassion and empathy for people. I think being gay in the church was a big part of my faculty in that area developing as intensely as it did. But then this other level of like exposure to what I define as divine love, like really broadened my own scope of like what embracing people could look like. Even people who were different from me, didn't believe like me, you know, so that was like pretty, specific. so I could keep going there. Um, some of these experiences had very specific <laughs> yeah. on me, but it was stuff like that. Yeah. And um, I just want to remind everyone you are listening to KSQD 90.7, 89.7, 89.5 on the California Central Coast uh, and Santa Cruz and Prudendale specifically. Um, we are talking to Father Nathan Monk and uh, Mike Maishiro. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that well. You can correct <laughs> me anytime. And um, we're talking about reimagining Jesus. And so Mike was just talking about how, you know, the love of God, the feeling of love for all people has arisen in his life uh, many or several times um, throughout the years. And Father Nathan Monk, I want to ask you too, because in your writings you talk about, and this is from one of your Substack essays on leaving the church, you know, I, I didn't leave soon enough. Um, first, you talk about in my silence, I have allowed these actions t to take place against LGBTQ plus people. And when those within the LGBT community have asked me to speak out, I have remained silent and I am ashamed of myself. Our hearts are capable of more love than our ancient religions can comprehend because they are crystallized in a time we have evolved past and I have allowed myself and my family not to progress. It is for this reason that today I forsake everything that I have known, my religion and my stability, and I choose love. These are very beautiful words. You talk about also having a now different relationship with Jesus. Do you still feel connected to the figure of Jesus or not at all? Are there some passages that still resonate with you that Jesus was supposed to have said? Well, I think for me, where I have gotten to, because that that you just read was from my resignation letter in 2013. And again, when I left, I think like most people who begin deconstructing their faith, I, I left with this idea, I would say something to the effect of, well, I... I'm now searching for the real Jesus, right? And and I would say that. And and I'm sure many of your listeners now have said things like that as they departed from the faith that they were brought up in. Where I reached later on in my deconstruction, really in the last few years, is I began to wonder if I was really searching for the real Jesus or if I was doing the exact same thing as I had always been taught, which was to try and create Jesus to agree with me. And so, but which is what the evangelicals do, the Catholics do, the Orthodox do, the Methodists do, everyone does it, right? We, we, we bend and contort the message of Christ to try and create him into someone that we want him to be. And, and I was like, am I doing that? And now, as my worldview has evolved and changed, am I trying to drag the corpse of Christ along with me into this new world that I'm creating for myself? And so I began, and, and it's really what began this Substack series for me, is I began to ask the question of, do I even like Jesus anymore? Or was I just holding on to him? And, <gasps> oh, my goodness. And, <laughs> and just, a lot it sounds of, so sacrilegious. <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. I know right. it does. Mm -hmm. And and I, I and and but it should, it should. And I began to ask that question of, you know, what value does this you know crazy kid born in a barn actually mean to me two thousand years later? So I began to investigate that premise of like why am I holding on to this this figure? For me, what I began to find is that there's a lot I don't like about Jesus and, and a lot that I find very offensive about Jesus. You know, Jesus tells me that I'm supposed to love my enemies and pray for the people that persecute me. That means that I 
instead of trying to figure out how to, you know, attack, dismantle, and destroy Donald Trump, my job as a Christian should be, how do I get to Mar-a-Lago and get five minutes in front of this guy so I can maybe convince him to stop hurting people? I don't want to do that. Mm. It is so much easier to hate people. And so, you know, as I began to uncover this real Jesus that I was searching for, I found that I didn't like him very much because mm-hmm. he was challenging me and demanding things of me that made me feel icky and uncomfortable. Yes, finding Jesus giving me permission to love the LGBTQ community was exactly what I was searching for. Jesus telling me that I was supposed to love the sex worker and the cam girl and the, the OnlyFans model. I knew I would find that about Jesus. Jesus telling me that I'm supposed to also be trying to free the oppressors, not just the oppressed. I don't like that Jesus very much. I would be much more comfortable hating people. Thank you. And so, I mean, what I'm hearing in what you're saying is that this is challenging to you, but do you disagree? Like, it sounds like maybe the challenge is I fundamentally disagree. I should not have to love the people who persecute me and my friends. Okay, gotcha. It okay, is that... so much easier to get away from that mentality and live in the justification of, of they don't like me, so therefore I don't have to bring them in. But I can't find that in the scripture. The scripture does not allow me, once I jump on the other side of the fence of I'm loving the oppressed, it now does not allow me to other the oppressor. And what an inconvenient person Jesus is. <laughs> <laughs> that is so interesting to me because I come from a spiritual background uh, in terms of psychology um, and believing that everyone has innate goodness and innate mental health, you know, and that there's all this conditioning inside of, you know, that, that people get. And that's why they behave like, you know, Donald Trump was abused by his father and his mother was sure. absent and so forth. And so I guess I've had to come to my own um realizations and insights about what does it mean to be an activist? What does it mean to call people out? What does it mean to protest? What does it mean to be confrontational? And and also understand that people are human and flawed. And, you know, like, I guess I've come to the conclusion that we can do both. I'm going to take this over to Mike Mayashiro. Me- Me- um, and I'm going to read first a belief, the beliefs from your website, the NUMA website. Here at NUMA, we follow the leading and guiding of God's indwelling spirit. God is not separate from us. The nature of love and the gospel cares for the marginalized and oppressed. We fully affirm our LGBTQ plus siblings and aim to equitably address the egregious harm done to this group of people by toxic theology. We are students of love, responsive to accountability, and seek to create a safer world devoid of ignorance and oppressive systems. We seek to address and end suffering in the human experience. Um, and so, um, Mike, are you resonating with what Father Nathan Monk is saying, or do you have a different take on all of this? No, I am, if I'm understanding him correctly. So, Nathan, feel free to chime in and, like, clarify. But I also, if I'm understanding the satire slash sarcasm in it, I mean, I feel the same way. And it is a rub. It's something that I think is really important and also really inconvenient and challenging. A lot of my work confronts bigotry that comes from white evangelicalism and the harm that just continues from institutions that perpetuate these terrible beliefs and continue to teach them as if they're like doctrine, right? Like it's terrible. Um, And so with all of that, as I look at Jesus and I look at the Bible, because the amount of deconstructing I've done, I could walk away from all this and be fine. Um, But there is a part of me that still sees value intellectually, but then also on an ethics level of things that Jesus represents and like preached that I don't know that we as a human race have figured out yet. We still haven't gotten this. And I think the overarching message of the Bible in general, but especially Jesus's message is obviously, of course, caring for the poor and the marginalized. Um, But ultimately like, hey, if you guys don't figure out how to exist with each other, how to not other each other and create enemies in your minds of other people and dehumanize them to justify eradicating them, if you don't figure this out, the outcome is Hell, and I don't think that's a like a cosmic place of eternal conscious torment. I think hell in the Bible, Jesus is pointing to an eventuality of us 
creating a horrific living experience, a horrific existence with each other where we're actually like devising and like creating byproducts that do just torture us. Um, and, and that so, it seems like that's where we're kind of heading these days. I mean, it's it's difficult. But sorry, finish your thought, and then I have yeah. another question yeah. for you too. So it's like with this, it's like man, I would love justification and you know the opportunity to demonize people like Trump and evangelical ism and just you know abusive church leaders that I've had to survive and recover from and whatever. Like it's easy to just want to dehumanize them back based on how I've been dehumanized. But I would say that the message of Jesus that is still there and I find compelling and inspirational and also really frustrating is that there are people, you know, on that side too. And that doesn't excuse the harm, erasing, you know, getting confronting and getting in the way of oppression, but that the way forward isn't to just do to them what they've done to us, find bigger rocks, throw harder and faster and have more of us doing that. Like that's not the answer. And I think that that's really important. And so I think there's a lot about what Jesus has to say that still is incredibly relevant and like leading for us. Okay. So I do want to point out something, and this might be a question for Father Nathan Monk, but either of you could answer it, is that there are times in the Bible when Jesus gets upset and people point to these times. For example, when he's in the temple and he's overturning the tables of the money changers and he's upset about the whole you know system of how the religion is set up to be, you know, at this point pretty corrupt in his mind, right? He gets very upset, he gets angry and he confronts the situation. The other one is when I think he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and people are falling asleep on him before the day when he is to be crucified. And he gets like, can't you even, you know, stay up with me? Um, and some people have said, well, that was just his human side or his flawed side coming out. But I guess that makes me feel like it's okay sometimes, right, to be disappointed. It's okay to be angry and turn over a table. Thoughts, Father Nathan Monk. One of the things I find so fascinating is in that verse where it talks about Jesus overturning the tables, it says that he fashioned a whip. And one of the things I find interesting about that is that means that he literally sat there and and wove this whip together. So he was not acting. Yes, he was angry, but he wasn't reactionary. He was taking the time to be mindful of the actions that he was doing. This wasn't Jesus throwing a temper tantrum. And, but yet we do find moments of him doing that. There's, there's the moment he goes to a fig tree because he apparently wants to eat some figs and there aren't any. And he is so angry, he curses the fig tree for literally no spiritual value whatsoever. We just know that Jesus got mad and cursed the fig tree. And so I think what we learn from those verses is that God is not so far from our humanity and our divinity is not so separated from our own humanity. And we've made God too big. We don't let God lose their temper. We don't let God make mistakes. And I think, if anything, I have in these last few years learned to forgive God for all of their errors that they made in the beginning when they were a new parent trying to figure out what the world was going to be like. You know, I just feel like there are so many other questions I want to ask. I'm going to direct people to your sub stacks and your websites. Nathan, you do work on homelessness. If you could, like, in a minute, just tell us what some of that work is and where people could go to find out about your, um, I think it's called social charity, but you tell us, uh, because you were homeless and you've written about this, um, you were unhoused, I should say. Uh, can you do that in like about a minute? Sure. So for me, uh, my my experience in my youth very much formed how I began to respond to the world around me, wanting to help fix these issues. I run a number of outreach programs and social initiatives, and now I am the CEO and founder of the charityinstitute.com, which is a consulting organization that helps nonprofits more maximize, maximize uh, <laughs> capitalize <laughs> on all of their success. They we want them to be better because I think so much of the nonprofit world is stuck in not creating an actual solution but maintaining the status quo. And so we want to help organizations get where 
they are actually eradicating homelessness, eradicating hunger, and that we have a, a mission towards fixing the problem, not just maintaining the problem. And what's the website for the organization? Uh, charityinstitute.com. Okay, and father, and then not father, but Mike Mayashiro. Uh, wait, no, let me go back. On Twitter, at Father Nathan, you can find Father Nathan Monk. On Facebook, also at Father Nathan. Uh, and on Substack with a podcast as well called Literary Anarchism. Now, Mike Mayashiro is on Instagram, we know. He has a website at mikemayashiro.com. That is M A E S H I O. Sorry. S H I R O, Mike Mayer Shiro. Um, is there anything you want to tell us about your work that's important for people to, to hear? Also, you have a podcast called Confessions of a Reformer. Yeah. Amy, you've done your homework. It's great. Yeah. So, the gist of my the work that I do now um, at the heart of it is I'm mostly working with queer people recovering from evangelical harm, whether it was their background, their upbringing, their current family situation, slash community. And then people who are coming out of evangelicalism who might not be queer, but are absolutely like confronting the beliefs they were raised with that they're finding are deeply problematic, but they don't have, you know, the way forward. They don't really know what to do with all of it. Um, that's predominantly who I'm working with at this point. So my team and I provide coaching. We have groups, um, facilitated group discussions, um, and then some content that's available. And then obviously I'm a content creator and I have a podcast. So I put content out in those ways as well. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Mike Mayashiro, and thank you so much, Father Nathan Monk. I hope maybe we can have you on the station again with us for Moment of Truth, uh, and thanks for coming. Thanks for having us, Amy. This is awesome. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I wish we had a whole other hour, actually. <laughs> so much to talk about. Um, and on, on the next Moment of Truth show, the life-changing magic of a union, a deep dive with national president, president of Trader Joe's United, Jamie Edwards. This is a special radio show and podcast produced by Mei-Ling Obinata and Yanko Nyasu and will run on my birthday, Monday, January the 1st, because needless to say, I am taking the day off, but I am still going to try to listen in. Please contact the Moment of Truth team at amy, A-M-I, at ksqd.org with questions or comments about our program. Amy's coaching and education website is at www.amychen.com. That's A-M-I-C-H-E-N.com. Moment of Truth gives many, many thanks to our team, Nyanko Nyasu, sound and tech engineer, and our research and production team, Nyanko, Mailing Obanada, Todd Zimmerman, and Vara Ramakrishnan. Todd Zimmerman of Nativeverse Studios created the theme song. Kathy Krizik created our logo. Thanks to our KSQD program manager, Howard Feldstein, and the entire KSQD team on the California Central Coast where the show originates. Thank you for tuning in to Moment of Truth. And remember, if we don't use our democracy, we lose our democracy. And that's a fact, Jack. <laughs>